So hello and welcome to our Aquatic Species at Risk in the Great Lakes webinar hosted by Green Goddard and the Lake Huron Center for Coastal Conservation. Thank you all for joining us this evening. We are shocked by the turnout and are truly thankful to everyone for tuning in tonight. Um, we have many at-risk species in our Great Lakes and it's very helpful um, for us as citizens to know how to protect these unique and rare species. So for those who don't know me, my name is Alex Robinson and I am the communications coordinator for Green Goddard. I am a graduate of the University of Guelph with a Master of Science in Environmental Science and I'm greatly passionate about the future of our natural environment. Um, for those who do not know Green Goddard, uh, we are a grassroots environmental group based in Huron County and we're dedicated to reducing plastic usage and carbon emissions in our local area as well as protecting our natural ecosystems. So you can find us on Facebook by searching Green Goddard or on our website, greengoddard.com. And with that, I will turn it over to Alyssa at the Coastal Center. Thank you, Alex. Um, yeah, it is so exciting to see so many of you on here tonight. Uh, my name is Alyssa Barassa. I am representing the Lake Huron Center for Coastal Conservation as your second co-host tonight. For those of you who do not know, uh, the Coastal Center is a registered charity and nonprofit with the goal of protecting and restoring Lake Huron's coastal environment. And to learn more about us, uh, you can follow us using the username at Coastal Center on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, or visit our website at www.lakehuron.ca. Education is a big part of what we do, so we are so excited to have Kat here tonight to share her expertise on such an important issue. So now it is time to introduce our presenter. Kat Lucas is the Aqualinks Program Assistant at the Toronto Zoo. She has a passion for conservation education and connecting others with the environment. She graduated from the University of Guelph with a Bachelor of Science, Zoology, and a Master's of Environmental Science with a focus on aquatic toxicology and fish reproduction. So with that, welcome Kat, I will let you uh, take it away. All right, thank you everyone for joining tonight and thanks Alex and Alyssa for setting all of this up. Uh, it might be best for our viewers to put on speaker mode or speaker view so that I will be the largest uh, person on your screen uh, and that'll be pretty helpful to catch everything I'm going to share tonight. And if you've got questions, I'm happy to take them sort of along the way. Um, feel free to throw them into the chat box. I will start with some slides uh, from PowerPoint Point and then about uh, 10 minutes in or so, we'll switch to some uh, fish models that I have uh, to kind of switch it up and have some fun. I know slides can be a little bit boring sometimes. And then uh, we'll finish up back on those slides and we'll have time for some more questions and discussions at the end. So without uh, further ado, I will start sharing my slides. I might not be able to see the chat box the whole time when I'm uh, sharing my screen, uh, but I will try and catch up on those questions as we go. So as Alyssa mentioned, uh, I am the Aqualinks Program Assistant at the Toronto Zoo. And Aqualinks is specifically our classroom hatchery program where we actually uh, raise Atlantic salmon in classrooms with students. They get them as eggs, take care of them for about six months and then go release them into the local waterways. Uh, this year it's looking a little bit different. Last year looked a little different, uh, but usually uh, it's a really fun program and students get to learn so much about a locally endangered fish. Uh, my background, I have a Bachelor of Science in Zoology as well as a Master's of Environmental Science, both from the University of Guelph. And uh, with my Master's, I focused on aquatic toxicology and I was looking at how pharmaceuticals in our water are affecting fish reproduction. So when we take medicine, our body uses part of it and then we urinate the rest out. Uh, and so I was looking at Tylenol, which is a kind of drug that I'm sure many of us have taken in our lifetimes. And and luckily, even at very high concentrations of Tylenol in the, the water supply, the fish models uh, were doing just fine. So if you're someone who needs to take Tylenol, uh, you can continue to do so with no guilty conscience. 
We've also, I've also got a certificate in environmental conservation and leadership, as well as back in the spring, like many of us, I had a little extra spare time on my hands. So I decided to be productive and enrolled in a certificate of community development and engagement to learn more about engaging different communities uh, on many different topics, including conservation. I am bilingual, so I can do this presentation in French as well. Uh, and we do these presentations for school groups too. So since so many students are learning from home right now, uh, we do offer these free virtual presentations all about the species at risk that we have here in our Great Lakes. So if you know an educator and they are looking for some fun for their virtual classroom, um, you can feel, feel free to email me at that address there and we can help you with a booking uh, and get the Toronto Zoo in your classroom, even though you're all the way in Godridge. And before I start, I would like to do a land acknowledgement and acknowledge that the land that the Toronto Zoo sits on is a traditional territory of many First Nations, including the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, the Mississaugas of the Credit, and many bands of Chippewa, including the Chippewa of Georgina Island. So we do acknowledge that our First Nations people were long the stewards of our land, the caretakers of our land. And hopefully after this presentation today, we'll learn a little uh, something new about the land and wildlife around us and can continue to keep caring for the land um, that is nearby. I do see some things in the chat. We can do a quick peek, I think. Oh, it's not popping up on top. All right, we've got some excitement from the crowd uh, from all different institutions of learning and it's wonderful to see so many people excited uh, to learn more about these species at risk that we have here in our Great Lakes. Uh, so the star is where you are tonight in Godrich and of course the lake, the Great Lake that is the closest to you would be Lake Huron, which is actually our Great Lake with the longest shoreline uh, because of all of those islands in there as well as the extra shoreline added by Georgian Bay. The Great Lake that is the closest to me though tonight, I am out of, uh, based out of Toronto, uh, so Lake Ontario would be my closest Great Lake. But we've also got Lake Erie, which is the smallest of our Great Lakes. Lake Michigan, which is the only Great Lake that's entirely in the United States of America. And then up top we have Lake Superior, which is the largest of our Great Lakes. And Lake Superior holds about 50% of all of the water in our Great Lakes, uh, so it is very big. We know all along the bottom of the map is the United States of America and up top is Canada. So it is very important for both of our countries to be working together to protect the Great Lakes because the Great Lakes region is home to about a quarter of all Canadians who do get their drinking water out of these Great Lakes. But they are also home to about 3,500 living things, uh, different species of living things. Uh, so if we're not too worried about it for ourselves, uh, we should definitely worry again for all of these different animals and, and living things that call this area home. Oh, and they're in their names. <laughs> So we've got so many different kinds of habitats here in our Great Lakes. I'm sure when living on Lake Huron, you know all about those beautiful sandy beaches with that big open water. And of course, these big open water, uh, the big open water in our lakes is really great habitat for many different kinds of fish who are bigger and need more space to live. We also have lots of rivers that connect the different bodies of water in our Great Lakes. Uh, some of our rivers move quite quickly and that creates good habitat for some animals who like water that's quite fast. On the other hand, we also have lots of wetlands and that water is very still. It's almost not moving at all. And of course, there's different kinds of living things that prefer that more lazy life uh, in our wetlands. And then we also have lots of rocky areas like up near Tobamori that have lots of hidey holes and habitat space for some sorts of living things that might prefer a, a little bit more safety. And we have all of these different living things here in our Great Lakes. Like I said, 3,500 species in this region, everything from insects, and there are many insects who start their life in water, things like dragonflies and mosquitoes, as larvae, as babies, they start in the water, uh, and then they grow their wings and leave as adults. Of course, we have lots of fishes, and that's going to be the, the main focus of today's presentation. We also have crayfishes, reptiles like our turtles, plants, 
fungi, mussels, uh, and mussels are hopefully something we'll get a little bit more insight onto today and maybe get a little inspired uh, and learn a little bit more about our freshwater mussels. They're often overlooked. A lot of them look like rocks uh, and we don't even realize that they're there, but they do some really helpful stuff for ecosystems, which I'll touch on today. We've also got mammals like our beavers, birds and amphibians like our frogs and toads. Uh, so, so many different kinds of life and I'm sure up near Lake Huron, uh, you've seen many of these different kinds of things uh, in your local areas. We have over 150 different kinds of fish here in our Great Lakes, everything from small minnows like our red side dace up to the Great Lakes largest freshwater fish, which is the lake sturgeon, and that can grow to be about two meters long. Of these 150 species, about 20% of them are listed as at risk or endangered. So that's a pretty good chunk that need our help. And we really need to start considering how humans have impacted their habitat uh, and, and figure out how we can best help them uh, to, to have uh, a chance uh, to rebuild those populations. And here are freshwater mussels. We have about 40 kinds of freshwater mussels here in our Great Lakes, making us Canada's freshwater mussel hotspot uh, because uh, we have 40 of the 50 species that exist in Canada right here. And these freshwater mussels, as I mentioned earlier, they are very helpful to our ecosystems. And that is because they are almost like a natural water treatment plant. They are filter feeders, which means they uh, open up a little bit, take in some water. They will eat things like algae and bacteria like E. coli, and they'll basically kind of spit the water back out even cleaner than it was to start. Uh, so that's so helpful to keep our water clean, especially when a lot of our human activities have caused the water to, to have some of these pollutants as well as a lot of algae. Of these freshwater mussels, about 65% of them are listed as at risk or endangered. So that is a very large chunk. And uh, again, these, these are often overlooked. Even by researchers, not a whole lot of research has been done about the freshwater mussels. So we don't really know how to best help them at this point. Uh, but at the Toronto Zoo, we are doing research looking at which sorts of freshwater mussels exist in the greater Toronto area, which is research that didn't exist over 10 years ago. And here we are trying to, to keep learning more so that we can better protect the freshwater mussels that we have in Ontario. And now to get started, let's look at some of these fish. Uh, this one here is a lake sturgeon. And it is, uh, like I said, uh, the largest freshwater fish that we will find here in our Great Lakes. And they will reach over two meters long. They are a prehistoric fish, which means the family of lake sturgeons existed before and during dinosaurs. However, of course, our dinosaurs aren't here today, uh, but the lake sturgeons managed to, or the sturgeons managed to survive. Uh, so that is pretty neat. And we know just how old they are or their family is because their skeletons aren't made of bone. Uh, they are made of something else and maybe you have an idea in your mind. Uh, it's the same thing that our ears and our noses are made out of, which is cartilage. Uh, and that is that softer, softer sort of uh, material that isn't quite bone. And that's what their skeleton is mostly made out of. You might be thinking of another animal, another fish even, that is also made of cartilage, and that would be a shark. Uh, so you can see that they, they are pretty closely related and both existed before and during dinosaurs and both of these families exist again, uh, continue to exist today. Maybe you're looking at this shark and all of those really sharp teeth in there and you are worried now about swimming in the Great Lakes with these lake sturgeon. Uh, and the good news is, for us at least, is that lake sturgeon actually don't have any teeth. Uh, instead, they have these barbels, these whiskers on their chin, and they are covered in taste buds. And they will kind of dig through the sand and gravel at the bottom of these lakes, uh, and they will taste bugs, aquatic insects that they find. And as soon as they taste them, they slurp them up whole. Uh, so they are not something that's going to be out there nibbling on our toes. Uh, so we don't need to worry about them here in our Great Lakes. 
The lake sturgeon are endangered though here in our Great Lakes and they did historically live in Lake Huron. However, these days their population is much more limited and even just in the past few months they've moved from threatened up to endangered which is a step closer to extinct um, and that is not the right direction that we would like to see for these lake sturgeon. One of the main reasons that lake sturgeon are endangered is because of how long they live. They can live to be over 100 years old, which means that everything in their life happens a little bit slower. They don't reach sexual maturity until about 30 or 35 years old. That's 30 to 35 years to stay alive, avoid being eaten uh, by other fish while they're still small, avoid all of this human activity to make it to 30 and have that first round of eggs or babies. And unfortunately, <laughs> it's a really tough life out there. When we put it in perspective, humans, we also live to be about 100 years old, uh, but we reach sexual maturity around 15 years old. Uh, so it takes about twice as long for those lake sturgeon to hit sexual maturity compared to us humans. Another reason that lake sturgeon are endangered is because of something that some fancy people like to eat, which is caviar. And caviar, of course, are fish eggs, the fancy word for fish eggs. And uh, unfortunately, it used to be pretty popular to eat lake sturgeon caviar, um, though luckily about 50 years ago they did start a ban on harvesting lake sturgeon caviar, uh, and the plan was to start see these numbers going back up after this ban, however it's still been a real struggle. Uh, so it wasn't quite enough for this ban, there's still other threats out there uh, like just surviving to age 30 um, that are causing these lake sturgeon to, to struggle. I am now going to stop sharing my screen and pull out some models. Unfortunately, I don't have a two meter uh, long lake sturgeon model here in my home, but the other fish that I'm going to talk about tonight are a little bit smaller. Um, and I will just take a moment to catch up on some of these questions. Uh, let's see, we've got lots of people that are excited from all over the place, which is so wonderful to hear. Um, this is the largest presentation I've done so far virtually. Uh, so it's so nice to see that so much interest is out there. Um, and hopefully we learned something new tonight and uh, feel free to ask questions as you've got them, just post them in that chat box there and I'll, I'll catch them as I go for this part. But next up, we have this little fish here who is called a red side dace. And you can see it's got red, on its side and dace is just another word for a small fish. Uh, so you can see it's even as a life-size full-size model here, it is only as large as my finger. Uh, so they are quite small. These red side dace, the, the, about 80% of their population lives within the Lake Ontario watershed, so heavily in our Greater Toronto area. However, there are still populations on Lake Erie as well, uh, or, sorry, Lake Huron as well, uh, up near Sault Ste. Marie as well as uh, down on the south end too. And these little red side dace are really awesome for us humans uh, because they are a carnivore who loves to eat mosquitoes and flies. And I don't know about you, but I am not a big fan of mosquitoes. And I'm sure many of you spend time outdoors in the summer and can appreciate a fish that eats mosquitoes. In order to catch these mosquitoes, they will jump up out of the water about 10 centimeters up and they will snatch those mosquitoes right out of the air. Uh, so that is pretty impressive of this small fish and they are the only minnow in Canada who eats this way. Uh, so very special and we can definitely appreciate how many mosquitoes they are eating for us. Unfortunately, they are another fish that is listed as endangered and their main threats are human development, uh, which includes pollution and littering. And these are a kind of fish that need very clean and clear water in order to hunt because they are heavily relying on their vision to look up into the air from the water to see those mosquitoes flying around. And if the water becomes pretty murky and they can no longer see through it, they can't see above the waterline and now they can't catch their prey. 
So unfortunately, they are struggling here in our greater Toronto area, for sure, with all of our human activity and that big city life. However, I think the populations closer to Lake Huron aren't seeing as, uh, as many issues as our ones here in Lake Ontario. Do lake sturgeon come down to the St. Clair um, area, I scuba instructor. Um, so they, they can. Historically, their population would have been a little farther south for the lake sturgeon, but uh, these days it's, it's uh, a little bit more secluded um, and moving a little farther north into Lake Superior, where it is the largest lake. And of course, these very big fish need a lot of space um, that Lake Erie might not have been able to, to really give them or these rivers connecting to Lake Erie. Uh, but they, they would historically have been down here as well, uh, maybe even in as long as uh, your scuba instructor has been around. Uh, does the type of feeding from the minnow make them more vulnerable to predators? And um, it, it could, if they're, if some predators might be birds for them, uh, and a bird might be hanging around waiting to see this kind of action um, and scoop down and grab them. Uh, but um, so it, it could for sure, as well as some other, like a lot of their, their predators would be fish as well. Um, so a little bit of both. Your son would like to know if there are clams in the Great Lakes. And uh, I did talk about freshwater mussels and a mussel is just that fancy word for a clam. Uh, so we do have uh, clams or, or freshwater mussels here in the Great Lakes. And I will be talking about one that we do have near Lake Huron as well. Does man-made hard shoreline protection impact habitat and species? Uh, so we, we do see some impacts with erosion uh, and then often this man-made habitat or this man-made shoreline would trying to be mitigating this erosion. However, uh, it's hard to know for sure. Um, and maybe another example might be down near uh, Hamilton Harbor, right, where all of those industries were, were put up on top of this landfill of this uh, man-made fill. And unfortunately, it's, it's been a long go for Hamilton Harbor figuring things out. Uh, but I think there, there is some, some potential in the future to, to get that area uh, really working again for, these, uh, for this wildlife. How can we help grow fish sturgeon? Um, I, I don't know for sure. I think because they are pretty secluded up in Lake Superior, I don't know whether there would be much human um, impact that could help them other than you know the, the regular things of, of us trying to protect nature, uh, which we will talk about a little bit in this presentation too. All right. Next up, we have this American eel. So this again is a full size model, about one meter long or so. And one pretty neat thing about American eels is that they will all gather and spawn in one place in the whole world. And that is just off the coast of Florida on the Sargasso, in the Sargasso Sea, which just is an area within um, the Atlantic Ocean. And so they will all gather there and, and spawn and lay those eggs. And those eggs, when they hatch, they are almost entirely transparent and see-through. So that is really great camouflage to start their life. Uh, they are often called glass eels because just like glass, you can see right through it. And that's pretty important because uh, they need that ca camouflage because they will be starting a, a pretty long migration. And there would be a lot of natural predators out there who would be looking to eat them. And as uh, the eels don't do any parental care, uh, they have those babies and then die. Uh, so they're not sticking around to try and help these babies live this first vulnerable stage of their life. Uh, they need everything they can to help avoid those predators. These glass eels will swim from the Sargasso Sea off the coast of Florida up the Atlantic Ocean on the east end of North America, and they will start turning into some freshwater rivers. Once they hit these freshwater rivers, they will hang out there for the next uh, next good chunk of their life. Um, usually about five years or so, they will stay in the rivers. They will start eating lots of different food that's more available there compared to the ocean, um, especially things like aquatic insects is what um, is kind of their first stage of their diet. And then as they grow, they start to eat more fish um, until they are a nice full sized American eel. And once they are an adult, they will turn around and swim all the way back down to Florida and continue with that life cycle. 
This round trip migration can sometimes be about 5,000 kilometers, uh, which is about the same as us getting into a car and driving all the way up to uh, the Yukon and back. So about 500 hours in a car. Uh, and I don't know about you, but that's not an ideal trip for me. Uh, but these eels, they're swimming that whole way. And on the way back down to Florida, they have a one track mind. They have just one thing they wanna get done, which is breed. And so they will often not eat at all. They will save all of their energy for this breeding and they will actually let their digestive tract start to break down. Uh, so they will let their stomach disintegrate uh, because they're not eating. They want all of that energy for this swim and for breeding. Uh, so that is one very long journey for them. However, these are another fish that are endangered here in our Great Lakes, and that is because of barriers to this migration. Kind of in the olden days, the first things that would have been barriers would have been things like pulp mills and lumber mills. However, as uh, humans got a little bit more into development, we started to see a lot more hydroelectric dams. And these dams were just huge barriers that they just couldn't get around. They can't get where they need to go to eat or they can't get where they need to go to breed, uh, which are both big, very important life stages that the eels uh, are now uh, not able to do. So unfortunately, um, it's been a rough go for our eels and they are still trying to recover from this. Um, uh, and um, they do have some tricks up their sleeves though. Uh, one really neat thing about American eels is that they can breathe in water like a fish. We know they've got gills, but they can also breathe on land, uh, which we know most fish can't do. And when they come up onto land, they can kind of wiggle around like a snake sort of, and then they'll produce lots of mucus all over their skin. And once they're covered in this mucus and nice and slimy, they can actually breathe through their skin. Um, and then that is kind of helpful for navigating around some of those barriers that might not be too big um, and help our, our eels out here. I see some questions, let me catch up. Some people have seen some of the fish I've talked about. Uh, we've got some people meeting each other. <laughs> How do eels reproduce? Um, hmm, I don't. I don't know for sure. I didn't. I didn't know that they might be different from other fish. Uh, so that, that might be a question for Google. I'm not too sure about that. I was under the impression they were the same, but I'm gonna have to look that up later too. We've already gone past the lake sturgeon, but let's go back to talking to it's endangered. Um, the population is being possibly being impacted by shipping and fishing. Uh, so in terms of fishing, it is illegal to catch lake sturgeon. Um, it's illegal to catch any of these fish that I'm talking about tonight, um, other than a catch and release scenario, uh, because they are listed as endangered. So there are regulations protecting them. Uh, so fishing likely isn't a problem, though, um, bycatch can sometimes be a problem, especially with a large fish like a lake sturgeon. They can sometimes get caught in the nets that are put out for other kinds of fish. Um, and unfortunately, it's, uh, it's sometimes too late by the time you pull up the net and notice that you've caught a lake sturgeon. In terms of shipping, uh, there isn't too much shipping um, going all the way into their habitat. A, a good chunk of the shipping going through the Great Lakes ends in the Hamilton Dundas area. Uh, so it, it likely not, not too big of a deal for our Lake Sturgeon up in uh, Lake Superior or even Lake Huron. And we've got some lake sturgeon still down in Niagara River. So that's good news too, that the population uh, hasn't condensed too much out there. And then we've got a question about eels migrating beyond Lake Ontario. And historically, they haven't really gotten too deep even into Lake Ontario. Uh, so generally, they're really just at the eastern end of Lake Ontario. Um, they're the, the big habitat that really used to be uh, their favorite would have been Ottawa River. And unfortunately, that was also where a good chunk of our lumber and pump, uh, pulp mills popped up, uh, which really did have an impact on these eel populations populations. And next up, we've got 
the Atlantic salmon. So again, this is a full sized model. And just uh, to start kind of going off that, this guy really only would have been in Lake Ontario historically. Uh, but of course we do have um, Atlantic salmon that are in the Atlantic Ocean. But we had a, a very special subpopulation of Atlantic salmon that lived in Lake Ontario uh, uh, back in the day. Uh, for millennia, they existed as a subpopulation that didn't travel all the way to the ocean. So we called them landlocked. Uh, they would spawn in our freshwater rivers and then head down to Lake Ontario and then back. And that was it, instead of going all the way out to the Atlantic Ocean. And this particular subpopulation from Lake Ontario is listed as locally extinct. Um, and the, the big word for that is extirpated. Uh, so they used to be here for millennia, but our first settlers came in around 200 years ago, saw all these wonderful Atlantic salmon in, our, uh, in Lake Ontario and overfished them down to basically nothing. Um, enough so that they still haven't been able to recover over the past 200 years. As I mentioned earlier, we are doing some conservation work with the Toronto Zoo, as well as with our partners, the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters, and the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. And for the past 12 years or so, uh, us groups have been releasing about um, tens of thousands of Atlantic salmon into our Great Lake or into Lake Ontario and its tributaries. Uh, so the good news is that 12 years later, we are starting to see returning Atlantic salmon in our uh, in our tributaries of Lake Ontario. Uh, so we are hoping that in the next five or so years, uh, they might have a self-sustaining population and they won't need to uh, have so much human intervention anymore and will be able to really uh, continue life on their own. Atlantic salmon have a very interesting life cycle. They will start their life off as an egg, and this here is a fake salmon egg, um, often used as bait, and they are about the size of a green pea, usually bright orange or bright red in color. From here, they will hatch into what we call an alvin, and that's about a centimeter long, about as long as your thumbnail, and at this point of their life, like those eels, they are super vulnerable to predators and everything else that they have to put up with out in nature. And so they have to be ready to enter the world on their own now. And they are fortunate to come prepared with this yolk sac, uh, which is basically uh, this big orange blob. We'll show some pictures when we head back to the slides. And this orange blob is full of nutrients. Uh, it's like a built-in fridge. And they are able to hide in the gravel and avoid being eaten by other uh, predators while they're out there until they're a little bit bigger and a little bit stronger and can catch food on their own. From this Alvin stage, they grow into a fry. That's about the same size as a little French fry, uh, about an inch long or so. And at this point, they're ready for the world and they can go off and catch their own food. The fry will then keep eating and keep growing until they reach the smolt stage. And this is about six to eight inches, usually at a couple years old. At this point, this is like the teenager stage. They say, I'm done living at home. I'm off to go see the world. And they start their migration. So the subpopulation in Lake Ontario would just swim down to Lake Ontario. However, we know there's lots of Atlantic salmon in the Atlantic Ocean. So they would be going from the local freshwater rivers on the coast right out to, Lake, um, to the Atlantic Ocean. And Lake Ontario and the Atlantic Ocean, they are both like an all you can eat buffet. So there's so much food out there and they will grow from this size here to full sized in about three to five years. Once they're full size, they are ready to spawn. So they turn right back around and uh, complete their migration and go and uh, spawn in our freshwater rivers. The landlocked population, of course, was not doing this very long migration. So one great benefit for them was that they could spawn for multiple years. Our salmon who live on the coast, they are so stressed out by this long migration that they will spawn and then die. Uh, so it was pretty interesting that we could keep um, those populations up with these, this landlocked group uh, because they could keep spawning for multiple years. Let's catch up on some of these questions. 
Um, so I will talk about some of those solutions to barriers uh, with hydroelectric dams in just a few minutes. We'll go over some of those threats, but then some of the things that us humans have, have figured out and started helping. Um, the subpopulation developed different traits from the main population. Well, I, I, I did just mention about um, being able to spawn for multiple years uh, because they aren't expending all of that energy, as well as they've adapted to living entirely in fresh water. It is pretty hard for a fish to live in both fresh water and salt water. So that would have taken a lot of uh, evolution and adaptation to manage both uh, high salinity and low salinity. Uh, so it's also interesting to think that they would have adapted back away from that to live just in fresh water. What is the possibility of hatchery based breeding for specific species? Uh, so it, it depends, I guess, on the species. Uh, as you can see with the Atlantic salmon, they are able to breed um, in the wild. Uh, so that is some good news. However, many of the, the different kinds of sports fish that are stocked uh, are not necessarily able to breed in the wild, uh, which is why they continue to be stocked by the government uh, for, um, for fishing. Uh, zebra mussels, we will talk about that in a little bit. I'm going to go over a couple different species of um, invasive species that we have here in our Great Lakes. Uh, preferred food of our Atlantic salmon, um, as, as um, when they are small, they are eating plankton and they are, are fully carnivores. So they are eating um, maybe some, some insects at the start of their life, but their main diet would be fish. And they are usually top predators in their food webs. So they are eating a, a lot of things that are smaller than them. Uh, I don't know whether they've started eating round gobies, which are another invasive species. Um, that's It's hard to know just yet. I think there are some uh, native species that are eating round gobies, but obviously not fast enough to really keep them under control. How did we get from extinct to eggs for Atlantic salmon? Uh, so that's another good question. And we, um, my understanding is that we are using Atlantic salmon from that ocean population to get those eggs. Uh, so it's not necessarily going to be the same genetic sub uh, population. However, you know, over an evolutionary timeline, um, they, they likely will evolve again. And, and we might see that, that same genetic line that we saw in the past. Pacific salmon are also being released into our Great Lakes uh, as a sports fish. Uh, my understanding is that they are not reproducing. So they are one that, that would have to keep being introduced um, to, to keep them stocked. subpopulation from Lake Ontario is landlocked and not the fish that the zoo is rele releasing uh, because they are extinct. Uh, and that is my understanding, yes. Um, so they, they are not necessarily the same subpopulation that, that did exist before. Uh, in terms of up in Lake Superior, I'm not sure what is being stocked up there for certain. Um, a lot of different sports fish are being stocked, um, as well as Atlantic salmon um, wouldn't be stocked up there. Uh, but the government definitely is, is doing a lot of conservation work as well as introducing uh, species that that there is interest in seeing up there. If there aren't more questions right now, I am going to head back to the slides and I will catch up again on the questions at the end. Uh, so let's go back to these and we'll see some pictures of the things I talked about. Uh, so here's our red side dace. As I mentioned, they are the ones that jump into the air to eat those mosquitoes for us. Then we've got that American eel and right in the middle, you can see um, the, the baby stage, that glass eel almost totally see through, uh, which is so great for their camouflage. Then our Atlantic salmon, up top we see those eggs. Um, and then next up we have the alvin with that yolk sac on their body that's full of nutrients for them to absorb. And then finally we have the fry stage, uh, which is when they are starting to catch their own food. We also have spotted gar here in our Great Lakes, which are another endangered fish. And I think they are a pretty awesome looking fish with all of those beautiful patterns and that pretty, pretty neat looking long beak uh, full of sharp teeth in there. And we have a model that's being made right now. So unfortunately I can't share it just yet, but hopefully in the next month or so we will see our model of our spotted gar. 
They are an ambush predator, which means they sit and they wait and they'll hide in vegetation or shadows or, or even underwater little rocky caves and they will hide until they see something they want to eat, then they will jump out and grab it. As we see on the picture on the left there of the spotted gar with a, a nice fish in its mouth. And they are nocturnal fish, which means they're most active at night, which again is very helpful being an ambush predator, lots of places to hide in the dark. However, they are endangered and that is because of habitat destruction. Um, we're seeing a lot less plants and vegetation these days that used to be a good hiding spot for these gar. Um, and plants are very important in ecosystems because they can often hold the, the substrate, the, the sand or the, the clay at the bottom of these lakes. And without plants, it often becomes really murky and there's lots of uh, little, little particles floating in the air, uh, in the water. And the spotted gar rely so heavily on their sight. And if the water becomes really murky and dirty, they can't see their prey uh, and they might not be able to catch a meal. Uh, so it's a pretty, pretty difficult life for them. And they are ones that we would find um, on the south end of Lake Huron. Then we've got northern riffle shells, which are kind of freshwater mussel or a clam. And these ones here are a little bit on the smaller side of our native freshwater mussels, uh, just, a, just about an inch, a little bit bigger than an inch long. And mussels are in the same family as a snail. So they have a hard exterior shell and a squishy living thing on the inside. They, as I mentioned earlier, they are filter feeders. This little guy can filter about nine liters of water in an hour. And again, they're pulling out things like algae um, and combating those algal blooms that we're seeing, as well as eating uh, bacteria like E. coli. And of course, we don't wanna be in water <laughs> swimming with that kind of stuff. And we also don't wanna drink uh, all of those things. So it's pretty important for them to, to be doing this ecosystem service for us and keeping that water clean. And um, they are another one that is endangered as, <laughs> as we've seen a theme here tonight. And they are endangered because of the invasive zebra mussel. Uh, so those zebra mussels have come in here, they have spread all over and they are just out competing with our native mussels for food and for habitat space. And, and we will talk a little bit more about zebra mussels in a minute. And these are some threats, so I have mentioned quite a few of these already, uh, but we are seeing a lot of habitat loss and habitat destruction, uh, whether it's our farmers fields that keep growing and growing, trying to feed everyone and just getting a little bit closer into our natural habitats. Same with our cities, we're finding more than ever that we humans would rather live in the big city instead of the country. And unfortunately, we're seeing so much human development and it keeps going into our green spaces and just putting so much pressure on our, our natural bodies of water. We talked a little bit about overfishing and these days overfishing isn't so big of a deal uh, because there's many regulations in place to stop um, fishing of endangered species as well as um, of taking more than we need as well as that aspect of bycatch. And we've got those hydroelectric dams, but we did have a question about how are, how are humans mitigating all of these um, issues with our fish that migrate. And one thing that you might see in a hydroelectric dam these days are something called a fishway, which is like a, a underwater uh, fit, um, water slide for the fish to take. Uh, we also see something called a fish ladder, which are like steps that the fish can jump up and over. And then sometimes we also see something called a salmon cannon, which is like a big tube that the salmon can go into and be shot up and over these dams. Uh, so even though us humans put all these big hydroelectric dams in here, we've also figured it out and found some ways to help these fish get by. And of course, pollution and littering is also a big issue here in our Great Lakes. Uh, again, we have such, such a big human population near our Great Lakes that it often means a little bit more pollution, a little bit more littering happening. Uh, so we just have to be careful about um, the kinds of waste that we make and make sure that we're getting them into those the appropriate spots. And the invasive species that we've seen a few questions about so far. Um, an invasive species is some sort of living thing. It's come from somewhere else and now it's here causing problems to our local species. Uh, so we will get to do a little meet and greet and, and see some of these up close. 
To start, we have the sea lamprey, and those are those two black snake-like things attached to our, our friendly trout there. And they are latching onto that trout using a mouth that's full of really sharp teeth. Um, the mouth is about the size of a toonie, and they latch on and suck the fish's blood. Either the fish ends up dying or it falls off a little early and the fish has a big open wound which can often get infected uh, and often kill the fish as well. Uh, these guys here made their way into our Great Lakes with the help of our man-made canal system. Um, it's possible that they would have made their way in without the canals, but it would have taken a little bit longer. And as we can see from their name, they came from the ocean um, and they are a saltwater fish. However, they came into our freshwater and they said, it's not really my favorite, not really comfortable, but look at all this fish that I, that I can uh, munch on. Uh, and they've been able to, to stay and, and figure it out. However, the good news here is, because this is a good, good news story, is that the sea lamprey are no longer a, um, a major threat here in our Great Lakes. Uh, they, there's been some really wonderful work done by our federal government, as well as many different conservation groups who have basically gone to where they know that the sea lamprey want to breed. And as soon as all of these adults get together, they scoop them out and they don't put them back. Um, and that's been a really great way to manage these populations. Um, so good news story there. Usually the number one question I get at these sorts of <laughs> presentations is whether this would get me. And the easy answer is no. Uh, they prefer cold-blooded animals and humans, we are warm-blooded. We can sort of control our temperature uh, be, um, compared to our surroundings. Uh, so they are going after those cold-blooded fish. However, maybe you have a lot of extra time on your hands these days. Maybe you feel really strong and you're thinking about doing a long distance swim across one of our Great Lakes. If you chose Lake Ontario, it would be about 40 hours of swimming in the water and your body temperature would drop enough to confuse a sea lamprey. Um, and so there are stories of these long distance swimmers who have to stop yank off these sea lampreys and of course they're wearing a wetsuit and of course we have hands which makes it much easier than these poor fish uh, but not to worry. Also last February I had the opportunity to have a sea lamprey suck on my hand and in my line of work you have to say yes to this kind of opportunity. So the sea lamprey uh, sucked on my palm, it hung on for about 10 seconds and then it said yuck and I said yuck uh, and it fell off. Uh, so I've lived to tell the tale, I have no scar, it was just like a little suction cup uh, and so <laughs> I'm a, a real advocate of swimming in our Great Lakes and not being worried about these lake surgeon trying to get or these <laughs> sea lamp right not the lake surgeon uh, trying to get us. Next up we have zebra mussels and those are those smaller mussels those smaller clams that are on the bigger one on our left there and you can see some of them do have those characteristic stripes those zebra stripes which is how they got their name. These guys came here in the 80s on uh, cargo ships that came from Russia. And when you move cargo, you load up all your cargo on the top of the ship, and then you fill this interior tank called a ballast tank with water, which helps uh, balance out the, the ship so it's not too top heavy. So in Russia, they would have filled that tank with the water in their port and then brought it over here offloaded the cargo and then they dump that water so the boat is lighter and it can have a faster trip back home. Unfortunately, we didn't realize that these zebra mussels were hitchhiking and catching a, a free cruise from Russia uh, and they've gotten into our Great Lakes and have just spread like wild. Uh, so they have covered pretty much everything that we have in our Great Lakes. They'll cover the motors of boats like we see in this middle picture if the boat hasn't been moving for much time. Uh, and then we also see um, it covering our beaches and our docks and they are just all over the place. We don't quite have a way to, to con control them just yet. However, there, there are some good news stories here and there. They haven't quite made it to the west coast of Canada. So they are as far west as Lake Winnipeg in Manitoba right now. 
And there's been some really great um, work at the border of British Columbia and Alberta. They've actually trained sniffer dogs to sniff uh, boats that are coming in on trailers to sniff out these zebra mussels. And these dogs have been doing a really great job uh, finding these zebra mussels and then they can properly clean and disinfect these boats and then send them on their way into British Columbia so they don't spread any farther. Also about a month ago, I did read some research about how um, in Michigan, they've been trying some, um, some pilot projects and some research there where they're adding copper to the water to see if that's affecting the zebra mussel populations. And in some of these test sites, they saw 90 to 95% of the zebra mussels uh, die after being treated with this copper. Uh, so there is some hope there and a little bit more research that needs to happen before we see whether that's something that will be effective in all of our Great Lakes. Uh, and we might have a way to properly manage these zebra mussels in the next, uh, hopefully 10 years or less. And then we've got Asian carp, and Asian carp uh, are the broad term for four species of carp. Uh, black carp, which we have on the right, silver carp on the left, uh, big head carp, and grass carp as well. And all four of these species were brought here intentionally by us humans. Uh, some of them were used in decorative ponds uh, where in, people wanted different alternatives. Instead of like goldfish or koi, they wanted to switch it up. Uh, and unfortunately, after many big rain events, a lot of these ponds flooded and ended up um, seeing these <laughs> Asian carp escape and enter our local bodies of water. They are a problem because they are very disruptive in ecosystems. Like these black carp, they like to dig in the roots of our aquatic plants, trying to find aquatic insects. And when they're digging around, they pull up those plants. And as I said earlier, those plants are keeping the water nice and clean and everything settled. So the water becomes really murky. And of course, our friends, uh, our fish friends who need to see their prey to catch it are having a tough time. However, this is a good news story as well, uh, because there are no self-sustaining populations of Asian carp in our Great Lakes. Uh, so again, we've got these conservation groups and the government working to scoop them out uh, when they go where they want to go to breed, or at least stopping them from getting to the locations that they would like to breed in uh, so that they are not uh, populating and um, adding to the, the, um, the populations. On the left here, we've got a picture of the silver carp that are jumping in the air. And if you're looking for a laugh these days, you can check out some videos on YouTube and watch these carp jump into the air uh, when they get scared by boats going by. I am going to catch up on some questions here and then we'll just finish things off about the ways that we can uh, protect and help all of these species here in the Great Lakes. Are the fish on the endangered list just in Canada or in the US too? Uh, so to clarify, the ones that I have showed you tonight are um, listed on the Ontario um, provincial list of endangered or species at risk. Uh, so depending on different populations, uh, they might fall into different spots in different areas. Uh, so something like the eel I don't believe is listed on the other side of the border. Uh, so the eels that we've got here in Lake Ontario and uh, Ottawa River would be listed as at risk. However, species that are, are south of the border uh, might have different classifications. Yep, the sand cannon again, that's another thing you can go look up on YouTube to check out some funny videos there. Um, the whitefish and cisco, I believe, is also uh, listed as at risk, but I don't know for sure off the top of my head. Uh, does the salmon cannon shock or stun the fish on impact? Uh, my understanding is that it doesn't. Um, and I've also um, seen the salmon cannon used for non-man-made barriers. Uh, so sometime last year, there was a big uh, landslide out in British Columbia, and they actually pulled out the salmon cannon to help the fish get over the landslide who were trying to migrate. Uh, so my understanding is that it's, it's okay for these fish and not too traumatizing. Did the lamprey break through the skin for my skin? No, it did not. Um, it was on there so briefly. And again, it, it didn't like what it was tasting. Uh, so it hopped off. 
The zebra mussels are still a problem in Lake Ontario, as well as the quagga mussels are, are out competing them too. Uh, so we've got uh, these two different invasive species, the zebra mussel and the quagga mussels, who are, are in our Great Lakes and um, they are both quite well spread out and they are both, again, out competing with our native species. Um, there are some people who say, uh, well, you know, the, the water's never been cleaner. Look at the great work that these zebra mussels and quagga mussels have done. However, um, if our freshwater native mussels had the chance, they would still be cleaning that water for us too. Um, so they just need the chance. And Jan says, I got that question. Carrie is saying, they are using some different ideas here. Uh, so that's great to know that there's some other other things other than this copper and there's things that are currently happening right now since that copper is still in the pretty beginning stages. Uh, so that's good to know. Um, I think I might have answered a little bit there about quagga mussels. Um, and the biggest single fish kill in like nuclear plants, is this true? Um, I don't know the answer to that question about nuclear plants. Um, I'm, I'm not too sure about that. I know that those nuclear plants can often uh, put warmer water into our Great Lakes, which could be a stressor to some fish who are, are used to that cold water. I, I don't necessarily know whether they are, are killing fish populations for sure though. And I am going to head back to the slides. We'll just finish things up. And then of course, there'll be time for some more questions at the end. So what are some things that we can do to protect the Great Lakes? We've heard about some really awesome fish and, and other uh, freshwater mussels that we have here. Uh, but what, what, how can we best protect them? One thing we can do is to conserve water uh, and make sure that we are, are being respectful about how much water we are taking um, and that's available to us. Uh, so some things we can do when we're brushing our teeth, we can turn off that Oops. Let's go back there. Uh, so we can conserve water and, and when we're brushing our teeth, make sure that we're not leaving the tap running. These days we're washing our hands more than ever and of course it's so important we want to stay healthy and stay safe. But again, when we're lathering and getting that soap all around, we can turn off the tap and then turn it on again when we're ready to rinse our hands. It's also the beginning of the year, so maybe you're looking for some sort of New Year's resolution to add uh, to, your, to your goals. And one, in, one idea that could be helpful is to think about how long your showers are. A good shower length is about seven minutes. Uh, so if you have a thought about how long your own shower is and maybe think of some ways that you can bring down um, how long your shower runs. We also don't want to litter, right? We don't want to be litter bugs. Don't be the kind of person who throws garbage anywhere. Um, that's not, not the kind of person we want to be. And I'm sure so many of you are spending time outdoors and you can really see the impact that litter has on our natural areas. We also want to consider that our sinks, our toilets, our tubs are all connected to our local waterways. So we want to be careful about what we put down the drain. Some things like expired medicine should go back to the pharmacy rather than down our drains. And especially at this time of year, we want to be considering how much road salts we need to use. In the greater Toronto area, there have been studies where they've seen that our local water uh, waterways are as salty as the ocean after a big snowfall and people put so much um, of this road salt out that gets washed down our sewers into our local waterways. Uh, so we know we've got these freshwater fish who want to stay in fresh water. Uh, so we'll just be careful about how much road salts we put out or whether we can try and add some sand or other alternatives to our, our road salt as well. We all know our three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle, but we've got two new layers now to add on. We've got rethink, which is about really reflecting on those activities we do every day and the products we use every day and think about whether those are good for the environment or how we can make them better for the environment. We've also got refuse, which is about saying no to those things that are not good for the environment. Maybe next time you're getting fast food and they offer you a plastic straw, you just say no thank you and move on with your day. 
all the way at the bottom now we've got recycle and that is because there's some new research out there that is saying that every time um, we put something into the recycling only about nine percent of it is actually being recycled so that means about 90 percent of those things in our blue bin are actually going to landfill um, and we are we're wishfully recycling here thinking that everything is going to get reused uh, some of those reasons that they are ending up in landfill is because they aren't clean and empty. So some things like our peanut butter containers or yogurt containers really do need to be clean and empty before we put them in the blue bin. Otherwise they can contaminate other things in there and then end up just going into the garbage instead. The good news is, is that our provincial government has said that in 2022, we will have a brand new blue bin program, which will hopefully get us all back on the same page and have a, a program that works for us again. I expect that most of us on the call tonight are of age to vote, uh, so we can use our voice and vote for things that we value. However, we can also use our dollar and vote that way as well by being an informed consumer. Maybe the next time you're at the grocery store and you're looking to buy some seafood, you can pull up the Monterey Bay Seafood Watch Guide or OceanWise. Um, they have a guide as well. And it'll help you make some better choices for sustainably harvested fish or seafood when you go to the grocery store. There's also some new research that shows that every time we wash our clothes, little threads are falling off, going down the drain, getting by our water treatment and entering our local bodies of water. This is a problem because a lot of our clothes is actually made with plastic these days. So if you check your label and you see something like acrylic or polyester, it is code for plastic. Uh, so these little threads are going into our bodies of water and they are now finding fish and birds are eating them and mistaking them uh, for worms or other sorts of food. Uh, there are some things though that we can do to help uh, reduce how much of this ends up into our natural uh, waterways and some things we can do are to buy less clothes and take uh, a little less pressure off of these fashion um, companies to keep pumping out more and more clothes because making things out of polyester is much cheaper than using natural fibers uh, most often. Uh, we can also start reading the labels of our clothes the next time we go to buy something and try and, and make some choices towards those natural fibers. We can totally <laughs> retrofit our washing machines with a really fancy filter, uh, but that's not really within most people's means. It costs more than the, the price of your washing machine uh, to begin with, so it, it's very pricey. However, there's more affordable options. There's something called a guppy bag, that's G-U-P-P-Y bag, and it's kind of like a garments bag and you can put your clothes in there. Things like workout clothes are most often made with polyester because they are quick dry and they don't smell too bad, which are things you want in your workout clothes. And you put them in the bag, zip it up and it has fine mesh on it. So any threads that would come off get trapped in here uh, and you can just keep reusing that and reusing it to keep catching all of these fibers. I talked a little bit about freshwater mussels today and hopefully you might have sparked some interest there and you want to learn more about freshwater mussels now. Well, the Toronto Zoo has partnered with the Department of Fisheries and Oceans and created a community science app called Clam Counter, which can be downloaded on your smartphone. And the next time you're out and about in the spring or summer, uh, when it's a little bit warmer out and you're close to water, if you find some freshwater mussels, you can use this app to try and identify these mussels that you found. And um, these uh, sightings that you submit are then sent to the Toronto Zoo and the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, where our scientists can take this data and use it to better inform our conservation work so that we know where these freshwater mussels are and how we can better protect them and their habitat. And of course, none of the work that we do at the zoo would be possible without all of these wonderful partners, whether they're different conservation groups, academic institutions, or our government. Uh, so we're so fortunate to be able to work with such a, a wide range of organizations to inform people about conservation and also do a lot of stewardship and on the ground work as well. 
that is everything I've got for you tonight. Thank you so much again for coming. It was so wonderful to have such a large crowd who are so interested in learning more about the Great Lakes species at risk. We do have some social media pages. Um, so we've got a few listed here as well as a Facebook page. So if you would like to keep up with the work that we're doing and learn more about some of these species at risk, um, you're welcome to give us a follow. And I will now take some questions. I did see lots happening over here. Let's see. Uh, so we're seeing that with some warming in the lakes that some uh, commercial fisheries have been affected. And I think that's about um, the nuclear power plants. Um, So yes, water conservation might not be too big of an issue just yet, uh, but as I said, we're seeing more and more people head to our big cities and our big cities only have so much water availability. So if everyone is taking a lot of the water, we don't wanna really see that water availability creep up too much. I think even in the greater Toronto area, we're taking about 40% of all the available uh, water that we have. Uh, so if- if that population continues to grow, then we might see um, even even more challenges with our water. Uh, so the great um, the Asian carps usually do not breed in the lakes. They actually prefer shallower water in our wetlands. Uh, so there are many conservation groups who are trying to bar the, the Asian carp from getting into the wetlands uh, where that would be their preferred breeding spot. So that's that's one of the techniques to managing that population. Yeah, we've got the comment about the filter and a plant-based diet, of course, is another great way uh, to reduce your carbon footprint and really um, uh, make some good choices for the environment. For the litter, of course, um, these days we see a lot more people entering uh, our natural areas because <laughs> we don't want to stay home. Uh, so we're looking for new ways to get outside safely. Uh, so unfortunately, we are seeing um, uh, some more litter in a lot of our, our parks. And hopefully we can safely uh, pick up some of the litter if we can and get it out of the environment. Yeah, we've got guppy bag, that's the spelling there. Clam counter with the terminology, some of the things are hard to understand. And I know um, it's actually so interesting, the different body parts of these freshwater mussels. Um, and as Kelly is saying here, they, they actually do have teeth. And while they aren't exactly teeth that we expect us humans to have, uh, let's see, you know, I've got just about everything here around my desk. Uh, but this here is a one of our freshwater mussels. This one's called the purple warty back. You can see it's got purple on the inside and warts on the outside, which is how it got its very unique name. Uh, but here we can actually see this would be one of its teeth here. Um, and it's got some other teeth here as well. So hopefully the app does have uh, some better information. And I can, of course, take um, this feedback back to the zoo. And we are almost always updating the app. Uh, so we can add some more information there. Uh, for clam counter, do the mussels have to be alive? And the answer is no. I've used it with just uh, like a shell like this. We've done training um, with the um, Parks Canada. They've come for training and we do use our just um, the, the mussel specimens. We've got Alex sharing the link to the guppy bag so you can find that. Um, so wonderful to hear. We've got people on the other side of the border. Um, someone's asking about these presentations for students. And yes, we do all grades, um, mostly though grades one through eight, but we can accommodate grades outside of that as well. Asking about discharge of sewage from the municipalities. Um, we do hear quite a bit about that, um, especially like on the St. Lawrence Seaway and things like that. Um, and of course, we don't really want our sewage entering these natural bodies of water. Uh, sometimes the sewage is acts as a really great fertilizer for things like our algae. <clears throat> and then we see those algal blooms. Uh, so that is not something we would like to see. Uh, so hopefully we can get these systems updated. Uh, many of them are our old infrastructure so that we can start um, making sure that water gets really clean. 
Let's see, I just got lots of thank yous in here. Thank you so much, everyone. Again, I did mention my email at the beginning of the presentation. So if you have more questions or um, would just like to discuss anything I've mentioned tonight, you uh, feel free to reach out to me there. Um, Jan is asking about the Bagida Wad Alliance, uh, and I don't know specifically about that. I do know that a lot of our First Nations communities are doing some wonderful conservation work. Um, of course, they were they were long the stewards of our land and took so so good care. Uh, so. The, like we work with many First Nations groups, so uh, learning more about what's out here in our Great Lakes and how to better do conservation, especially with uh, our native bat conserva conservation program that we have at the zoo, all about bats works very closely um, with our First Nations groups. Does Clam Counter share data with iNaturalist? Uh, and I don't believe it does at this time. I think it, it's a partnership we would like to explore a little bit more. Um, but one neat thing about Clam Counter is that it works everywhere in Canada. What type of cross-border cooperation and sharing of data is there? And um, there are quite a few groups that do um, work and collaborate across the border. Um, there's um, a group called the International Joint Commission, which does lots of research and knowledge sharing across the border. Um, and that would probably be the main one for our Great Lakes region um, and, and lots of good work coming out of there. All right. <laughs> and, uh, someone has shared uh, the hockey score tonight, and I do appreciate if you've chosen this presentation over the hockey game, uh, because I know some people in my household have that on, uh, so they don't have to listen to me do this for another time. Uh, but thank you again so much for everyone who's come out tonight. Uh, I do really appreciate all of you spending some time, and I appreciate Alex and Alyssa for doing such a great job promoting this and getting such a high interest. Um, and hopefully, um, if you've got more questions, you can just reach out to me uh, personally through my email. Yeah, thank you so much, Kate. Um, and thank you to everyone for attending this evening and for listening to all the excellent and informative information, all these amazing species right here in our own lakes. Um, so I guess we'll end it there. And yes, definitely email Kat if you guys have any questions at all. And I hope everyone stays safe and well. And thank you again for tuning in. Thank you so much, Kat. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>